with the mood dysregulation, PTSD, attachment disorders. You know, in older school age children, the, the ODD, conduct disorder, mood dysregulation, and PDD, you know, children that might be aggressive because they actually have a, an underlying PDD ideology. If that's the case, we need to think about that. And in adolescents, um, the, the range of contributing factors gets, ev gets wider yet. And one really big one here would be to just even think, is there a medication noncompliance that's happening? Um, are they getting new comorbidities? Are they getting into alcohol drug use or, or um, external modeling? This is what we're operating under uh, from uh, Dr. Pliska's algorithm here. We don't have a, a, a similar uh, one adopted for Florida. I think the current treatment issues that we are facing, we've already alluded to earlier, the high usage of atypical antipsychotics. You could say, well, that is the Pliska algorithm implemented. When there is aggression, you should be using atypicals. Question is, should it be quite as much? Because the other thing is, the antipsychotics may be used without having adequate ADHD medication in place. There's a study that showed that actually only 46% uh, uh, that 46% of, of children that were treated for aggression with antipsychotics and ADHD weren't even on an ADHD treatment protocol. Um, and uh, I, I would also say we want to remember that stimulants do have an effect size for aggression treatment. So just uh, studies that looked what is the outcome on aggression for when you use stimulants, you can expect uh, effects, helpful effects, nearly comparable to atypical antipsychotics. So, of course, that, that doesn't apply in every case, but we know there will be cases that you need to consider, do you have to revamp and bring the ADHD treatment at a good quality level before you go on to the next big gun? Um, the, the, I, I think another important thing to keep in mind is we're, we're kind of left with this, what are we really doing when we're administering these two types of medications? You know, at the most simple basic dopamine level, it's like, oh, we're putting an agonist and an antagonist together. Uh, why are we doing this? In the more complex dopamine models, uh, you can make more sense of it. But uh, there's also this practical issue of uh, dyskinesias, dystonias described when you have co-administered the stimulants and the atypicals and, and you, you stop one or the other. Um, and uh, the other thing that I wanted to just draw attention to is this WISE study here, they examined their own ADHD clinic. You know, this should be a pretty nice, high quality clinic that they're running, these ADHD experts. And they, f they found that about one in five of their patients was on atypicals um, and then 70% of them, and, and they were on low-level atypicals and were receiving nice ADHD treatment. 70% had at least one metabolic abnormality, and the most common one was that they had waist circumferences exceeding the 90th percentile. Uh, but they also had 16% full metabolic syn um, syndrome. They, they found that uh, uh, an unexpectedly alarming discovery and, and being simultaneously on the stimulants did not uh, protect against these effects or like having it be low doses did not protect against these effects. Um, and um, Gay Carlson also has always had such great sage obvious advice. You know, so they, they looked at, their, at, uh, at kids that were admitted for rages to their inpatient unit um, and they basically um, found that half of the children that were admitted for rages, they actually, once they were admitted, they didn't have another episode. You know, so they could respond to the structure and the intensive therapy that they received. But they also said, okay, in our, in our shop, 16%, even with our high intensity therapy that we're providing, they continue to have rage outbursts. You know, so there is going to be a group of very treatment resistant children. And now, what predicted um, exhibiting rages on the unit? Now, ADHD was a big one, a big predictor. ADHD comorbid with ODD and conduct disorder was a big one. And presence of language disorders. 
but not bipolar. Now this is the bipolar experts, you know, so they are not going to uh, call something bipolar if it's just someone who you know, is mood dysregulated or, or angry. She concluded um, that it takes intact attention systems to be able to to moderate your own distress and to not get mad and hit people and that you need language functions to mediate that self-control uh, and, uh, and, and she, her point here is we need newer and we need more effective treatments for these kind of these 16 percent of kids where the intensive inpatient and medications didn't help them to do any better and what's underway um, I, I looked at the at the NIMH website. So there's two studies uh, that I could identify. One is a step pharmacotherapy for aggressive youth and uh, there they're going to basically do a lead in behavior therapy and then uh, randomly assign to Risperidone or, uh, or Depakote. In the other study, um, it's a stimulant and, and Risperidone study. And, and I thought, you know, this is, this is good. We need that information. But I must say, I was also kind of like thinking, we really need more because this is already, th these are kind of the tools that we already have that we kind of know they're not really going to cover everything. So I'm like, I'm, I'm also thinking we need more and, and different things.